Hola. Uh, hello. Uh, I think it's time to start. Uh, Peter, do you want to join us also? Uh, Peter Negline Hello. from Singapore, uh, Bank of China, uh, co uh, board of director, member of uh, board of directors uh, with me and number of other people uh, of ISTAD. Uh, Peter runs the learning labs and is the man who gets all the credit, but uh, potentially all the blame. So he, he's the guy. Uh, Thank you, everybody. Good morning, good day, good evening uh, from wherever you are. Uh, this is, to me, a super important topic because we've been flying now 118 years, and I remember the early days uh, when I was a little kid. Uh, Things changed, everything changed, but for the last 60 years, maybe, speed did not. And this is the last frontier. We definitely should move in this direction. And there are, there are two reasons that, that we can think of that we didn't have the progress. And one is economic and the other uh, is sonic boom. So a technical reason. And we will start the first session uh, by bringing some world experts to explain to us what is the progress that has been made, why sonic boom is no longer the terrible problem that we faced 60 years ago uh, and where are we going there? And uh, there are two outstanding engineers that will talk about it. Uh, and I hope they will be kind to us non-engineers uh, and explain stuff in, in simple terms. Uh, we will have people from uh, Exosonic, uh, Norris Tai, co-founder, CEO, uh, personal friend, little boy, just a foot taller than I am, uh, went to UCLA, uh, aeronautical engineering, and then uh, has a master's MBA from Stanford and uh, another person in his team, a, a world renowned uh, engineer, head of aerodynamics and, uh, and boom at Exosonic. And uh, that's John Morgenstern. He started like all good people at uh, McDonnell Douglas. So there is something good to be said about him. And, uh, and then worked at Lockheed and NASA and knows everything you ever wanted to know. And hopefully will explain it to us in simple terms that the non-engineers will understand but will feel comfortable that, yeah, that's no longer a problem. And then in a couple of weeks, we'll have another session uh, with the founder of Boom, who will talk about the economic aspects and the, the practical, how do you run the program and so on. So, uh, Norris, it's all yours. And, uh, Knocked them dead. <laughs> cool. Thanks, Adam. And thanks, Peter and the ISTAT team for uh, this, this privilege to talk to you all. And I just want to add that um, I was a recent 2019 ISTAT U grad. And I see uh, one of our professors, uh, Professor Guzva, is on the line. So thanks for joining. I certainly 
learn a lot from your classes and uh, we've incorporated a lot of financial modeling into our own uh, modeling too on the airline side. Um, let me just get this thing set up on my computer. Uh, hold on real quick. Oh, there we go. All right. <clears throat> just a second here. <clears throat> cool. All right. So for today's presentation, uh, we want to share with you a little bit about Exosonic and our low boom supersonic airliner. Uh, to enable supersonic uh, flight everywhere. And then John will speak a lot about uh, low airport noise and quiet sonic booms and how that works. Uh, and then I'll close out by talking about the significance of flying supersonic everywhere and why we would want that for a 21st century supersonic area of the future. <clears throat> and so to briefly start, uh, I do want to share with you a little bit more about my own motivating factors for starting Exosonic. Um, and for me, the passion really started out when I was uh, growing up in the Bay Area and certainly flying a lot to Asia to visit my, my grandparents there. It was a very frustrating and long flight to fly 12 hours across the Pacific Ocean. And uh, it, because of that long flight, it really led to me not really visiting them as much as I would like. And because of the infrequent uh, nature of our visits, we really missed out on a lot of um, opportunities, such as holidays, life events, and more importantly, the opportunity for me and my grandparents to have a close relationship. And so at Exosonic, we really believe that distance no longer should be the barrier to having a close relationship. And in fact, visiting a distant loved one should be as simple as visiting a friend across town. However, there was an aircraft that did do this, and that's the Concorde. Um, as you know, it whisked people across the Atlantic Ocean in half the time, and it was around from the 1970s to the early 2000s. But unfortunately, at the turn of the 21st century, this aircraft was retired. And like some of the trivia uh, that was talked about before uh, the presentation, one of those main reasons was its loud sonic boom, which really restricted many routes that I could fly on. I mean, in fact, the Concorde had over 100 orders from airlines across the world. But when the United States banned supersonic overland flights, because of the loud sonic boom, many countries followed suit. And a lot of those Concorde orders were canceled, uh, leaving only British Airways and Air France uh, to have 14 of their respective airplanes. Not only that, but it was pretty expensive, uh, more expensive than first class today. And similarly, as Adam said, um, as we progress forward in time from the 1960s to now, even 2021, we've in fact gone slower over time. And, and growing up in the Bay Area where we see that industries are always getting better and faster, I thought to myself, that's pretty crazy. Like why isn't commercial aviation getting better, especially in terms of my flight times and getting around the world faster? And I simply did not believe that we were gonna fly uh, sub sonic speeds forever. There's got to be a faster way to get around the world. And so as a naive high school student in 2008, I thought, why don't I do something about this? Why don't I explore ways in which we can go around the world faster? And since then have dedicated my career to figuring out a faster transportation solution. And so as Adam mentioned, I went to UCLA to study aerospace engineering. I focused on propulsion uh, and worked at several companies, including Northrop Grumman and Lockheed Martin Skunk Works to figure out a faster uh, technical solution to transportation. And there I got the opportunity to work on the X-59 low boom supersonic uh, demonstrator uh, with John Morgan Stern as well. And I thought to myself, well, this is the answer. We've definitely had supersonic aircraft in the past and technology has only gotten better in our understanding of supersonic flight in the past 60 years plus this key aspect of muting the sonic boom. And then, so I went to Stanford uh, to pursue my MBA and then start the company. And now, uh, you know, how many, 13 years later, uh, that passion has turned into Exosonic, where our vision is to provide supersonic travel everywhere by developing an aircraft that cruises at Mach 1.8, carries up to 70 passengers uh, over a range of 5,000 nautical miles. 
And our goal is to really cut flight times globally in half by meeting the sonic bill. And so uh, there are two main reasons why this is the best time to start a company like this. Uh, the first one is, of course, regulations. And the FAA in the uh, 2018 reauthorization by Congress, they were actually tasked to develop supersonic civil flight policies. And some that are actually being enacted today, such as this certification process or testing of a supersonic uh, civil aircraft. And the additional feature is that the FAA is tasked to work with international players like ICAO uh, to make international standards to make supersonic travel accessible globally and not only at the United States. Now, the second piece is technology, and that's muting the sonic boom. Uh, and there's been a lot of development over the past 60 years that NASA and other countries have led to make this a reality. And now the technology for meeting the sonic boom has reached a state of viability where we can now predictably design aircraft fuselages to mute the sonic boom in a similar way that stealth airplanes are designed to be stealthy. You can design um, supersonic aircraft to be uh, quiet from the sonic boom perspective. And now I want to pass it over to John, uh, who's a world-renowned expert in quiet or shaped sonic booms. He'll talk more about the airport noise and sonic boom aspects. <clears throat> All right, John, here you go. Thank you, Norris. For this, we have uh, environmental constraints, particularly dealing with noise at the airport and in route with sonic boom. But of course, we want to satisfy all these constraints simultaneously and not trading off one for the other, which makes the job more difficult. Uh, and that includes uh, emissions as well and climate emissions. So we're working to make sure that the latest computers and uh, methodology that we can bring to bear on this problem, all the research that's been done over past decades uh, and bringing that all together as we've done that. I've been working in this area for over 30 years and with that uh, research. So brought all that together when I headed off, uh, left the X-59 program just in April because it seems well on its way. So I'll be around to watch it fly, but uh, I'm no longer heading up sonic boom for them. It's all defined and being built. Uh, so next slide. Airport landing and takeoff noise certification uh, has three points they're measuring at, the takeoff or cutback, sideline and approach. The takeoff cutback is flying over a monitor, so height and uh, being quiet helps you out. The sideline is a line of microphones off to the side and you pick the microphone that gets the loudest measurement which typically happens when the airplane actually goes through like about a thousand feet off the ground because the ground attenuates some of the noise before that. And you tend to notice this if you're at an airport or something, you hear airplanes taking off and suddenly they, they seem to get louder as they get up into the air a little bit. And that's the reason for that. Uh, so this is designed to help with that, uh, make sure the peak noise of the engine is uh, controlled and we also have one on the approach uh, condition. We are trying to design uh, our targeting. For this is a chapter 14, the very latest uh, subsonic noise certification rule. And since this will be a new engine, uh, it needs to be designed with a certain amount of margin so that we ensure we actually do hit the uh, noise target that we're aiming for. So it will be somewhat lower than that. The, noise rule is that it has to be the old chapter 14 uh, minus 17 EPN dB. And EPN dB is an integrated noise metric, meaning that the duration uh, as well as the level matters in coming up with the metric. So <clears throat> the challenge is to, you know, get the airplane up and away and uh, uh, keep that noise down. We plan on using uh, a lot of advanced computer optimization control of the throttling, 
along with the engine to get that noise compliance as efficiently as possible with as little impact on the airplane. Because uh, the challenge is we can't put a nine bypass ratio or more uh, engine on the airplane because that fan does not uh, produce thrust efficiently at supersonic speed. So we have to go with something a bit lower in bypass ratio and then to get the efficiency out of that, adjust it and uh, it's throttling in clever ways to, uh, you know, maybe put some, a little more noise on the runway, but uh, get it reduced as soon as we get up into the air and out over communities. And even addition beyond noise certification, supersonic vehicles tend to have more lift margin, don't tend to be stall limited uh, and have this uh, greater flexibility in the thrust. We have more excess thrust. So we ought to have more capability to tailor the noise to specific communities. And so we'll work on that and try to use that to uh, keep noise compliance uh, on par with subsonics. Next. But one of the challenges along the way is that supersonic noise and noise trends do not work exactly the same as subsonics. And one way in particular we're finding is that as we fly shorter range, the airplane carries less fuel and the supersonic airplane, as it turns out, starts to pick up excess power at like three times the rate of a subsonic, typical subsonic airplane. Subsonic airplanes a lot of times also pick up cargo when they're flying shorter distances, but the supersonic one is liable to be fairly space limited on cargo and not as able to uh, fill up that fuel with uh, cargo weight. So we expect a, a very different noise trend at shorter rates, at shorter ranges. Um, and at least for a typical commercial jet now, the median range that an airplane flies tends to be about 25% of its maximum range. You know, there's a lot more shorter missions and it flies actually fairly few out at its most extreme range. Uh, and so while that may be so somewhat different for supersonics, there's certainly going to be a distribution when shorter flights will be flown. So the challenge here is the noise rule, as it's set up for subsonics right now, is only done for the maximum weight, maximum range case. They don't measure the other noise. It could be used in the data fitting, but it's not part of the certification. So what I want to try to make sure is that we're not forcing supersonic airplanes to be quieter than subsonic airplanes. You know, nobody's saying that should be the case. And that gets back to my first point. You know, quieter is always nice, but we'd be paying more emissions for doing that. And on this airplane, it's costing more emissions per dB of quiet than it does on subsonics. So that's not a good system-wide solution. So keeping the same noise is something that we want to do and have to figure out how we achieve that parity, but that uh, the target and the belief of what everything is going for is that supersonic airplanes will be at least as quiet as the current uh, subsonic chapter 14 airplanes. So forget the Concorde and the very loud noise and the uh, not being uh, wanted at airports because uh, I'm telling you that we're making airplanes that would be very loud. Uh, it's going to be a very big challenge to make sure we keep the efficiency in there too. But uh, that's what uh, all these advanced computers and methods are allowing us to do so much better today than we could in the past. Next. And then the second uh, noise, the sonic boom. And this is a little bit busy. It's uh, from uh, uh, another report, but I just have a couple of points to make here. Sonic boom has some very different characteristics um, in the way that it propagates. So it starts off from the vehicle conically and spreads out uh, as that cone expanding. 
And because of this, it doesn't drop off in distance the way a typical spherical noise expansion does. Uh, it only drops off with square root of distance. And so the spreading, it does spread radially uh, as it heads away from the vehicle, but it gets affected by the atmosphere. So we typically start up in the stratosphere where the temperature is fairly constant and cool. But then as we get down into the troposphere, the lower 36,000 feet or 14 kilometers or something, uh, the temperature heats up in the atmosphere and causes the propagation to bend upward. It propagates a little faster at the lower part of the ray than the upper part of the ray, so that bends it. Uh, it turns out that causes something we call a sonic boom carpet. So there's a boom that's very loud underneath the vehicle. There's a boom that's loud off to the edge out to about 15, and it can even be uh, you know, 30 nautical miles depending upon the atmospherics, uh, temperature and winds. But at some point, it goes from being very loud to loud to nothing. There's actually a cutoff and the boom thereafter bends up and does not intersect the ground. And so we have a, a challenge that you can't just get far away from the boom to try to hear what it's like when it gets quiet enough. You know, we've got very loud and loud. So doing research to figure out what kind of boom is acceptable has been challenge, particularly challenging for this reason. Uh, also in the propagation, next chart, so it spreads laterally, um, but that same bending in the lower atmosphere causes the longitudinal or you know, the rays in the direction of travel to compress uh, a bit. And it turns out that if you track the propagation, the sonic boom you know, gets weaker with square root of distance till it gets down to about that 36,000 feet. And then it holds nearly constant the whole way from there to the ground. And then there's even a, a doubling as it reflects off the ground. So that's what is challenging why the sonic boom is so uh, loud when we hear it because it, it really hasn't attenuated in that whole uh, last portion of the propagation. So we've got a, a very uh, uh, loud amount of noise to deal with. And you'll see that we call it an N wave. The shape of son typical sonic boom has one large shock up front and then a long, much slower expansion and then a large shock at the back end. And it's really these two shocks that we hear. So if you hear a typical sonic boom for an airplane flying uh, flat and level, uh, you sometimes get something different from fighter maneuvers, but for a typical transport, you'll get this boom, boom, or the space shuttle too. Uh, it'll be separated by you know, 200, 250 milliseconds on the Concorde, um, but you'll hear two distinct shocks. And that's because that's where the upper frequencies are that we can hear. The slow expansion is below our hearing. So the way we get rid of sonic boom and reduce it is by shaping that waveform into something that has much smaller jumps in it. So next page. The challenge is that as the waveform propagates from those miles up in the air to the ground, the small amount of compression that the waveform itself makes and the small, you know, the little bit of expansion causes those parts of the wave to propagate a little bit faster and slower, respectively. So typically, you know, front end of the airplane compresses the air, back end of the airplane closing out, expands it then. And so the front travels a little bit quicker and it all piles up into one large shock wave, the worst shape for loudness. 
And the same thing happens in the rear in the other direction, the little bit of expansions or the expansions caused back there pile up into a single shock wave there on the way to the ground. And for an airplane like the Concorde, this happens in the first few thousand feet as it uh, propagates from the vehicle. So for you know, the other 47,000 feet out of the 50,000 foot altitude that it's flying, you know, it's an end wave. So what we do to get rid of the sonic boom is we control those uh, compressions and expansions to not exceed a certain threshold. And that's the, the lines on here, you know, there's sort of a maximum line and a minimum line above which if you go much beyond that without having something in front of it, you know, we're saying you can average that line uh, you can go a little above it as long as there's something ahead of it, a little below it. Uh, and then you won't have it all pile up into one shockwave at the ground. You can keep that from doing it. The other part that's a little, you know, it seems to make sense, you know, keep the, the shockwaves under control, make it quieter. But the other part that's uh, less intuitive is that in order to keep it from piling up into a single shock wave, you actually have to put a spike on the front of the signature, a pressure spike. And the reason for that is the very front of the signature will travel at the average between the ambient speed of sound and the little bit of compression that the waveform makes speed of sound. And so you, you get an average between those two speeds. So it will travel slower than the pressure behind it. And to keep that from piling up, uh, you know, and eating back into the shaped portion of the waveform you've made, what we do is we put a, a spike on there that's designed to dissipate. It's on the front, it dissipates more, but the spike is exactly sized so that it dissipates down to the rest of the waveform just as you get to the ground. And the, this aging slows as it gets closer to the ground and in higher ambient pressure relative to the pressure of the sonic boom. So, you know, there, there's uh, quite a bit of variety. It doesn't matter if uh, the ground's at 5,000 feet or zero feet, you know, it, it works pretty well for, for any of that. But uh, the key thing is just not, uh, you know, having something there to keep it from piling up and shrinking the length of that shaped portion. There's a little bit of one on the back end too that's not talked about much. They talk about the nose bluntness. The original paper called it exactly that bluntness because they used a blunt, leaving uh, a blunt nose to generate that spike. It turns out the spike, as you design for quieter and quieter boom, the spike gets smaller and smaller. So what we have right now is a very tiny amount of quote, bluntness. And you can even stretch that over a certain amount of distance because drag tends to go down very quickly as you sharpen it a little bit. But the boom goes up only very little and very linearly as you take that bluntness and stretch it over a little bit of distance. So like I said, the back also has this, but because there's a slow recompression to ambient, you know, the signature doesn't end at the end of the vehicle, it slowly recompresses back to ambient. And that allows the half signature to be actually a little off the axis and uh, allows us to get the weak shock jump back there. And it's a shock jump that drives the loudness. Uh, so by controlling these parameters, by controlling the lift and volume distribution of the vehicle, uh, we just have to have the lift plus volume, you know, keep it in this bounds of these slopes, you know, positive and negative, so that we don't get uh, an end wave at the ground, the worst shape that you can have. Next. So we can take that area and lift limits and the original paper by Dixie Bass and Al George that describes the sonic boom minimization published in uh, 71, but that's, uh, shows what the combination of these two need to be 
to hit that boom. And so that's what's on the plot here. Uh, there is a, the gray line is the sum of the area and lift must conform to that shape. And the blue there is, is the area from volume. And the orange there is the area from lift converted into a volume that would cause the same disturbance. So it's just a convenient way for us to do the mathematics of it so that we can see, you know, how important the lift is from a design standpoint, you know, we quantify it in square feet because we have a vehicle square feet and cross section and that just helps us uh, understand what the effect is. The other thing you can notice is the maximum volume here is a little over a hundred square feet, but the total lift, which, you know, the volume goes up and down, but the lift is, uh, you know, it, it's generated and then it stops. So it goes up to nearly 300. So you'll notice there's more lift than volume. So lift, it tends to be the dominant term here. And we're actually using volume with the lift to get a longer length overall. So we wouldn't want to get rid of the volume, so to speak. We're using the two of them together because it's the total amount of lift and the length that are the primary parameters for getting the boom down. So if I needed to make the boom a little bit quieter, I have to, for the same weight and flight altitude Mach number, I have to make it a little bit longer and spread it over a little more distance. Um, if you've seen the X-59 or when you see the X-59 uh, demonstrator that's going to demonstrate low sonic boom, NASA's paying for, uh, it's uh, spent a lot of time working on that design. Uh, you'll notice a very long nose for it. So it's uh, got a T-38 uh, type cockpit, but a hugely extended nose instead of a 50 feet of a T-38. It's 100 feet long almost. Uh, it's this extended nose that gets us this uh, front signature really stretched, really spread out. Uh, while it's very long, it's also very empty. So it's not really adding so much to the weight as it is adding so much to the visuals of the vehicle. Um, what we found is when we're designing for the loudness that we think is acceptable, we're very close to a minimum drag shape as well. It would be a little bit shorter, wouldn't have to be quite as long. And actually making it longer doesn't even increase the wave drag, but it doesn't reduce it as much as if it were stretched out in a pure Sears hack type shape. But we found that we can get the, uh, the drag of the shape can be a nice minimum wave drag, Sears hack type distribution. Sears hack is just a shape that we found as the minimum for wave drag. And that's of the overall cross-sectional area of the vehicle. Uh, so that is something that you can still do with low sonic boom if your lift distribution allows. Like I said, the two together add up to this target. So then if your lift is the right shape, it leaves a volume, that's a minimum drag shape. So the key is having the computers to iterate on these designs so that we can get all the practical things we need in the volume of the vehicle and have a shape of the wing and the lift distribution that allows that volume to be a minimum wave drag shape. And it was, it was asked a lot when we were first doing this. So, you know, how much did the L over D go down? And we were finding that the L over D of the low boom vehicles got better actually, but you're always paying something to put on another constraint. It got better because we were making the vehicles a bit longer. So the penalty for low sonic boom is not in performance L over D. It uh, tends to be in a little extra weight to make the extra length. And so we have a little better L over D, a little more length, so a little more weight, but still hopefully the same type of efficiency. And we're certainly targeting uh, having less than a 5% a uh, weight penalty uh, for what we're working with so that it can be 
and hopefully down to pretty negligible amount. So that's one challenge is uh, keeping that excess weight down. The second one is uh, just having the design tools to be able to do you know, this additional constraint on top of meeting airport noise and high efficiency and all the things you need for a cabin and bringing that all together. But the great thing now, so much advancements in computers, their speed, and the software that they run uh, is really making a huge difference for supersonics in this. So despite the fact that subsonics have advanced since Concord, I believe supersonics uh, with our latest tools have uh, advanced even more. So I believe we're, we will be closing the gap in performance doing uh, closer to the performance of the latest subsonics uh, with the designs that uh, come out now. Next. So what does this end up in the end? Well, you can do an unconstrained design or low boom design. And interestingly, like I said, the low boom design here is 5% uh, 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 a little bit longer. Yeah, listen. And uh, I made it 5% heavier just uh, for comparison. And for the basic one, we start off with a signature that's like 120 milliseconds long for its flight. And by the ground, it's like 200 milliseconds long. So when I say, you know, it, it, it stretches, it uh, propagates a little faster on the front end, a little slower on the back end. That's the kind of stretching, you know, almost double the length, you know, at least a two thirds increase in the length during propagation is stretching. So it's pretty volatile in terms of that, uh, stretching out when you haven't done anything to constrain it. Every single airplane, you know, that's ever been designed turns into an end wave within the first couple thousand feet of its propagation. So you have to specifically design for it to get the kind of control to achieve something different all the way down at the ground that could be 50,000 feet away. Uh, despite the low boom signal uh, and the vehicle being longer to begin with, the waveform at the ground actually ends up shorter. And that's because the stretching of the waveform is a function of this shock jump at the front of the vehicle. So there's a peak that's higher that compresses, but it's specifically limited to not compress enough to pile up with the front. So the whole waveform doesn't get as much longer. And what we're comparing here, you know, we've got, uh, uh, basic signal that's about uh, 1.8, 1.9 uh, PSF, uh, uh, 100 Pascals, and then a low boom one whose loudness is just the little jumps right at the very front and the back. So the increasing, slow increase of what we call a ramp and then the slow expansion and slow increase again, don't hear that just the little jumps. So the size of those little jumps are determining the loudness. They're about, uh, with a little bit of uh, rounding, about 0.15 PSF or seven Pascals. And so the difference in these waveforms here is uh, predicted is like 106 PLDB. And that's just a, a metric we use that has more low frequency sensitivity because there's a lot of low frequency in these uh, waveforms. But the difference we're talking about, you know, is the same as any other DBA or DB you're looking at. You know, we're talking over a 30 dB reduction uh, between these two waveforms. So one of them is bam, bam, and the other one is just a boom, boom. <laughs> a light thing and sometimes the charts are made showing you know oh a basic boom is like a you know, very loud sound and 20 if it's 10 db more it's a jackhammer or something and then the other one's like conversation or something i i can never really picture that myself even so what i'll say is uh nasa did an experiment down in texas where they used a regular F-18, you know, regular boom F-18, but they fly it in a special trajectory that makes the boom travel a very long distance before it hits the ground and they can make some very weak end wave booms down in the 0.1 uh, 
0.2 PSF range. Uh, unfortunately, it makes a very loud boom somewhere else, but in this case, they confined that very loud over the Gulf of Mexico and had the very quiet booms go into Galveston, Texas, which isn't used to experiencing sonic booms. And we were down there for this experiment and standing in a parking lot, knowing exactly that the boom was coming in two minutes. And we looked around at all the people going to shop in the local hardware store. And when it hit the little rumble rumble, um, we couldn't find a single person who noticed it. You know, we heard it, it was there, but it was, you know, just pretty much in the background and could have easily been uh, just some distant uh, thunder rumbling through too. Uh, we also listened inside and we found one person heard it apparently and, and turned toward their significant other and said, oh, we may have to get the umbrellas out on the way home. You know, they thought that it was uh, a sign that a thunderstorm might be coming, it was all. Uh, but uh, again, nobody else even knows it. So I'm quite confident that we've got the kind of loudness level that makes this disappear into the background. And uh, there will be a level that's uh, acceptable for overland flight and not acceptable like noise around an airport. We're talking acceptable for people who don't normally have to hear noise. So we're talking something much, much, much quieter than you know, the airport operations, which we're also working to reduce very much too. So it seems like it has a lot of promise uh, you know, carrying this forward, but uh, it is still a very challenging uh, objective to get all these things done and do it uh, with the highest efficiency possible. Because that's certainly uh, one thing we want to improve upon from the Concorde too, is uh, having technology make the economics uh, work out a lot better uh, for supersonics in the future here. So we'll do some questions at the end. You can flip just up the last page there uh, of mine, Norris. Uh, we're the, one of the challenges, supersonic overland is going to need some regulatory support as uh, the X-59 program that NASA is doing is going to develop some of the data supporting the levels, but we also need to, you know, write rules about how the airplane will be operated because it does have limitations on its operations. It can't do really strong maneuvering or it can generate what we call focused booms that are a bit stronger and we'd want to avoid those. So we'll just have to, uh, uh, you know, make sure we keep its uh, maneuvering uh, limited or it just has to slow down, which happens if you try to do a lot of maneuvering anyway, you'll lose speed. Uh, so if you need to turn around, what you typically do is you just slow down, turn around and then speed back up again, which may actually be a, a smaller turn that doesn't take a couple states to uh, actually execute the turn. So it might be the most efficient way of doing it anyway, but uh, that'll be part of the challenge there. Airport noise wise, interestingly, the rules pretty much work. Um, you know, there's an awful lot that we can just sort of take the same thing and rewrite it again. But there are some differences. Like I said, the supersonics don't tend to have a stall. There's an awful lot of things written for subsonic airplanes that are about the stall margin. Um, Concord gave some of the way on that. We'll be using some of the same rules that uh, they developed. Um, but there are, you know, a few little differences just uh, so that the words of it uh, make up for it. And then there's that uh, different trend, which you know, I'd like to see supersonics get credit for that. That may take a little bit longer, but uh, like to see, uh, you know, the supersonics judged on an evil play, even playing field with subsonics um, so that... Uh, we get the best emissions and efficiencies as well uh, for overall best system solution, along with uh, you know climate control, as we say too. So that is being addressed a lot by uh, counting on developments in uh, climate neutral uh, synthetic fuels and uh, those kinds of things. So 
we are committed to you know doing as much as we can on that and supersonics tend to be a bit less sensitive cost wise so i'm ex i expect they'll probably pave the way in the use of some of those uh, uh newer fuels and uh getting the demand going if we can get them uh, out into the market so uh, we expect to rely heavily on on using those to uh you know, keep everything in our planets working. So I'll pass it back to you, Morris. Cool, thanks a lot, John. Uh, so <clears throat> just to kind of summarize here, uh, on, so we can motivate why we want to fly supersonic everywhere. So it seems like, you know, we can have quiet supersonic aircraft, both at the airport level, where we can meet existing subsonic uh, noise regulations, in addition to providing a quiet sonic boom in the distance. And there's a slight penalty that we pay, right, in terms of weight, but we're trying to shave that down so that we can still get good aircraft performance, uh, like, like typical supersonic aircraft, but instead meet the sonic boom as well. And so, you know, we're doing a lot of this optimization work to fit all of these constraints while providing a great aircraft that performs well and can fly supersonic everywhere. And I want to share with you now why that's so important to Exosonic's business case as a quiet supersonic aircraft manufacturer. Why we think quiet supersonic transportation is the future of super, uh, supersonic civil transportation. And so first, I want to share with you a little bit about the routes that we can fly uh, going over water only versus going over land. And so what our team did is we looked at over 1,600 uh, very popular uh, global routes. And what we found was that if you can fly only over water uh, supersonically, then that gives you access to 340 routes. Naturally, a lot of those routes are between, uh, you know, are transatlantic between the East Coast of the United States in addition to the Western parts of Europe. And we even added a few routes where you'd fly subsonic a little bit inland uh, from those uh, from the shore. However, if you can fly supersonic uh, over land, then that number of routes that you can fly increases dramatically. In fact, it increases by 300%. And what you'll see here is that it adds 1,300 routes that are for overland flight only, meaning that we can fly the overland ones, the 1,300, plus the overwater ones naturally, and it's another 300 routes to get the total 1,600. And what this chart shares with you is that there's a lot of routes, uh, of course, a lot that are between Western Europe uh, and all across the United States. Uh, and, and you can go from Europe to Asia, uh, as well as Europe to Africa and you know, North America to South America as well. And so that's great that you can fly a lot more routes, but then how does that lead to additional aircraft sales? And so we looked at, it, that, at that as well. And so what we found was that you can sell three times as many aircraft when you can fly supersonic over land. Well, we're estimating the market size to be for over water only is 150 uh, versus uh, aircraft over land, that's 370, leading to a market that's 520 aircraft roughly, uh, which is, approximately $130 billion supersonic aircraft market. And so with an exosonics case, especially in an industry that takes a lot of money and time and a lot of regulatory hurdles to overcome, um, it's wise that you can sell as many airplanes as you can. And if you can sell three times of anything in any market, uh, that's, that's really great. Uh, and that's why we wanna focus on quiet supersonic travel because it extensively adds to the market size of a supersonic uh, aircraft manufacturer. Now, what does this mean for you as a traveler? Well, one example for us is that you can fly from Los Angeles, uh, where Exosonic is based, to New York City in basically three and a half, three hours versus roughly the five and a half hours it takes today. This is a route that has never been served uh, supersonically and under commercial, purpose, uh, commercial applications. And this would pretty much change the way that people travel across the United States. You could actually do day trips if you wanted to uh, between the West Coast and the East Coast and, and really change, again, business where you can do uh, day trips across the country. <clears throat> and so with that, 
like to conclude uh, this presentation and share, and I hope you uh, enjoyed listening to how we're going to usher in a quiet, sustainable, affordable future uh, for supersonic commercial aviation. Thanks, and I'll hand it off uh, back to Adam and the ISTAT team for questions. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Norris and John. Really appreciate uh, your insights here. Uh, can I just, uh, before I invite Adam to, uh, to start with a few questions, I'd just like to invite the audience. Um, uh, we'd love to uh, present your questions to both Norris and John uh, while we have, uh, have, have them on this call. So if you could uh, put your questions, uh, Q, any Q&A, uh, please uh, into the uh, tab at the bottom of your screen. Um, we'd be happy to ask those questions for you uh, as we go along. So Adam, uh, if you could join us, we'd love to uh, to, uh, for you to start with a few questions, if you have any. Hola, thank you. Uh, I have the non-engineering and not fair questions. That's where my strengths are. Uh, e explain to me, or, uh, no, give me an educated guess. Uh, on something that is, I know, impossible to predict political developments, <laughs> but what is the time that we will get rid of the threat of sonic boom and not being allowed to fly fa faster overland? I, I, I know that that would take a big change, at least in the US, uh, in the legal system. And uh, of course, our Congress, Senate are not 100% in agreement on anything. So for them to agree on this, uh, it's it, it would take a long time. But of course, it would help if they are US manufacturers, then, then suddenly they may move in this direction. It's not evil Europeans doing it, but, uh, but good Americans. Um, I, uh, nothing against even evil uh, Europeans. I spent a few decades in, in Europe, so I, I'm not actually, I don't actually mean it, uh, but do you think that with the progress that you are making, that NASA is making, uh, we will have in a few years relaxation of the rules that are stopping the human race to move in a direction that we should? Uh, give me the exact date. Uh, <laughs> Well, I, we do kind of have a date. Uh, fortunately, it's very easy in the U.S. to do the demonstrations of the technology because all it takes is the FAA administrator, uh, no one else, and they have rules and we have ranges that uh, we can do supersonic flight. I get a few sonic booms where I am near Edwards Air Force Base uh, from time to time as well. So we have places where you can fly and test. Um, NASA is going to be doing the X-59. They're scheduled to deliver all their data to uh, in time for Cape 14. We're on 12 now, so five years from now. Uh, so 2026 is uh, when we believe the technical basis for low boom flight will be established. Like I said, I'm confident having heard this kind of boom level that, uh, you know, I'm sure the people will be like, oh, this is, you know, I'm, I'm going to protest against it. And the minute they hear it, they'll be like, I've got better things to do. <laughs> this is such a nothing. Uh, so I'm quite confident we do that. It's probably more of an issue of just uh, how do we across the world, you know, believe and go forward with that. But that's just you know, a matter of uh, talking that through and stuff. Uh, it seems to me like uh, maybe X-59 needs to make a worldwide tour or something like that. So people, you know, you're always going to feel better if it flew over you and you didn't hear it. Or <laughs> uh, So that's even possible, you know, there's a plan for doing that. So, so John, 26, which means people who are planning to fly a type of a 
high-speed plane in the next few years will have to plan on flying mainly over water. Yes. Before 26, it will not happen over land. That's what you are saying. Yeah, that's what we're expecting to rule. We're hoping to get a tight application in a little bit before that, assuming we know kind of where that rule is going. Uh, we also are planning on doing a demonstration of a unmanned subscale uh, vehicle just for our technology and refinements uh, in the intervening time. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Peter. Do you I have guess questions or are there I, other people? I have a question, some of my own, but let me add just deal with one question from the audience uh, uh, um, from an anonymous attendee. Uh, how would you, how would the per trip costs compare to a similar sized uh, subsonic commercial aircraft? For sure. Yeah. So we spent a lot of time looking at the per trip cost. And uh, again, uh, from Professor Guzma's class in the ISTAT-U uh, lecture series, uh, it's been really helpful to get a lot of that buildup, I'd say. For example, doing our maintenance cost buildup in addition to fuel, crew, et cetera. And so what we found was that we are actually um, on a per uh, cost per block hour perspective, pretty similar to uh, long haul aircraft, but you have to think about the per hour basis that it's on. We fly those same routes in half the time. So from a per trip basis, we are actually half the cost. Now it's not that simple, right? Because you have to look at metrics like cost per available seat mile. Uh, and naturally these wide bodies have a lot more seats, right? We're thinking 70 seats, whereas a uh, 777 can have 350 seats. And so our cost per available seat mile will look uh, much higher uh, because of that density that subsonic aircraft have, but on a per trip cost basis, uh, we're half the price. So thank you, Norris. Well, look, just to remind the audience, uh, we, we won't have uh, Norris and John with us for too much longer. So please don't be shy getting your questions in, but um, uh, just a couple from myself. Um, can, can I ask, and uh, fairly basic, shall we say, on the material side, from a fuselage perspective, is there any constraint whether you use uh, aluminium or composites or anything like that, given the external pressures? I suppose it would be on the on the hull or not. Uh, as you know, Concorde flew Mach 2.0, uh, which is faster than uh, you know the supersonic aircraft that both Boom and Exosonic are developing, and that was an all aluminum uh, airframe. So we can design the aircraft with metallics. Uh, obviously, there's composites that are out there. However, Boeing's invested billions of dollars to understand composites, and so they have expertise in that. I think for a new aircraft manufacturer, it might be a little bit um, ambitious to develop a composites vehicle in the beginning, unless you have like a decade's worth of composites research completed to design an aircraft uh, safely. Okay, but from a structural or strength point of view, there'd be nothing limiting. As you say, it's just a matter of having the skill and the knowledge to... Mm -hmm. to, yeah. Okay. Construct it yeah. quickly. And, and is, is existing aircraft engine technology does that work for for the aircraft you propose, or do you, will you need a new engine? Yeah, I think that's a, a continuing negotiations with uh, aircraft manufacturers. But uh, from a state of the art on engine technology, yeah. I mean, we fly supersonic engines every day on our supersonic fighters. They just haven't been adapted or adapted for or for a civil. Uh, application in many decades. Uh, so we would combine the state of the art of military engines with the state of the art of commercial engines to design uh, a new uh, commercial supersonic engine, most likely. I, I mean, I, I pardon my ignorance, but is there any sort of a precedent where people have been able to get access to that type of technology that's more prevalent in a military context to be able to put into a commercial application? Uh, not really. Um, because we just simply haven't needed a commercial supersonic engine uh, ever right. since the Concorde. Uh, so, so no, uh, but uh, typically these military engines are, are pretty held closely by the nation states that develop them due to national security concerns. Okay, interesting. And, and just given the, mm -hmm. the trade-off that John was talking about between uh, the load and so forth, the, um, is it more likely you would start with a private jet size aircraft before you'd actually upscale to, I mean, I'm just sort of thinking of the, 
progression, both in terms of your mm -hmm. production expertise, but also just sources of revenue. And I mean, it'd be probably more appealing as a business jet in the first instance before you'd actually build a commercial size aircraft, or do you see it the other way around? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, from a business standpoint, like across the entire timeline of our company, um, I think it makes sense strategically to develop a product that uh, we can bring to the market much sooner. And, you know, one of your answers to a much sooner product is a supersonic business jet. Um, but we think there's something even smaller that you can develop that's uh, more affordable and less regulatory constrained, and that's supersonic UAVs. So we released a press release last week to, talking about some of our supersonic UAV work that we're doing for the U.S. Uh, Department of Defense. And we think there are some very... Uh, needed near-term applications for supersonic drones uh, for our Air Force and other services. And that will help uh, us develop revenue uh, for our company in addition to de-risking and a lot of technological aspects that would be relevant for the supersonic airliner. Um, but in terms of business jets specifically, um, we really wanna focus on the airliner and doing a business jet would be almost equivalent cost, uh, time to market, uh, and regulatory concerns as a passenger jet, maybe slightly, you know, slightly easier. Um, but we would prefer to work focus on the commercial airliner because of the mass market appeal of that. Okay, um, we we sorry, have you finished? Or should I carry on? There's a question from the audience from Vitali. It, it's mm -hmm. to addressed to Norris, and it's, uh, he he asks. Uh, it seems that faster business travel works well for westbound flights. For example, JFK to LA, a three hour flight means that a traveler can depart JFK at eight o'clock in the morning and arrive in LA at 8 a.m. Uh, eastbound travel does not work the same. Do you consider this potentially not equal directional demand in your business case? I think there's a little bit of that. Uh, there's certainly ways in which you can craft schedules that make sense. And we've talked to a number of airlines and a lot of, a lot of scheduling to show that. But if you, if you think about a day trip from uh, West Coast to East Coast, right? You leave California, 8 a.m. and arrive, I think, let's see, three, uh, like around 1 or 2 p.m. East Coast time. You do maybe, you know, afternoon meetings and a business meeting. Uh, and then that takes you to, you know, maybe 9 or 10 p.m. East Coast time. Then you fly back and you arrive roughly 10 p.m. Uh, West Coast time. And just go home. So you just your day is shifted back, right? You just do more like afternoon evening things rather than morning things. Okay, okay. excellent. Um, and can you just elaborate a little bit, just in terms of the the regulatory side? I just want to make sure. You know, I mean, John sort of touched on it: the fact that there's this imbalance between you, know, you being uh, having subsonic rules applied to you and so forth. I mean, what's the time frame and sort of? Um, I mean, is it just uh, just uh, just the FAA regulator, as John mentioned, that you you need to uh, get on board on that issue, or will there be other parties involved? Well, right now in uh, ICAO's Cape, where they set up the noise rules, we're asking for a rule to be you know standard and recommended practice for supersonic uh, noise certification to be put together in this next session and early in this next session. So we've done a lot of modeling and uh, we believe we can set that up. Um, this disparity that I talk about, we may not be able to you know, address that so much without it getting more complicated until we have data. So I'm kind of believing that we'll probably put in something more like subsonics to begin with. And then hopefully as subsonic stringency increases, we'll get more accurate way of uh, comparing the supersonics and thereby be able to continue to increase the supersonic stringency in step with the subsonic stringency by having that, uh, some of that trend uh, a little better modeled. Okay, so thank you. Well, at this stage- I think we're gonna have to eat it to begin with. <laughs> Yeah, I understand. Um, but that's all the questions we have from uh, from the audience and from myself. So Adam, I'll hand it back to you for, for any final remarks. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think I feel uh, much better that we will 
one of the problems will be resolved or we are moving, we humanity are moving in the right direction of resolving the big problem of boom, or of sonic boom, not the boom. Uh, it's the beginning of boom, hopefully, of, uh, of, of the airplanes. And uh, I hope that in a few years, uh, Norris, you'll be able to fly to China in a much shorter time and same for me. And, uh, <laughs> and life will be even better and great things are coming. So thank you guys for sharing your knowledge and uh, thank you everybody for listening. And Peter, thank you for running pleasure. the lives. A pleasure indeed, very insightful. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone. I appreciate the opportunity.